Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, we have several announcements before us um, that we are going to look at. The AGM meeting is following worship next week. There is AGM reports uh, on the back table here and on those two tables. Kind of feel like a stewardess down here and there. Um, so they're also been emailed to you. So following worship next week after the benediction, I will give you all a 30-second head start, and then anyone who remains within their seats with the tray table up will be a part of the AGM. Um, and then uh, we'll go through the reports. So please have all the reports read before next week. Uh, I assume everyone's read them, and we'll just go through them forthwith. Um, we're getting to the end of, I hate to say this, February, how quickly it has fled. Um, our newsletter, if you've picked it up this week, the trivia question that I had given everyone was taken from a website called Flower Letters. Because uh, I learned as I began to date that flowers mean something different when you give a woman flowers. So I figured I would trick you, I mean, challenge you to see what you all knew. So some of the flowers were at aster, uh, amaryllis, calla lily, red carnation, blue iris, yellow iris, purple iris, white iris, I obviously like irises, and pink carnations. I, I didn't give you an easy one like rose. So, what do they all mean? If you look at the screen, you will see them, and I will explain them, because we were playing the matching game this week. Uh, this month, aster means patience and elegance. I, of course, should be strewn with asters. Uh, amaryllis, uh, splendid beauty and pride. Calla lily means magnificent and beauty. Red carnations mean love, pride, admiration. Blue iris means faith and hope. Yellow iris means passion. That I did not know. Red iris means wisdom and compliments. White iris means purity. And pink carnations means love of a mother or woman, which is one of the reasons why at Mother's Day we give carnations. Um, I was at one church where they, they used to give carnations on Mother's Day, which is really nice. But then there was the awkward question because they, they believed in two colors, a white one and a pink carnation. So if your parent had died, you got a white one, and then you got a pink one. But I was at the door one day, and I felt really bad going, um, is your parents dead? Here's a carnation. And so I said, maybe next year we just give them all the same, and then it makes it easier. And they thought that was a good idea. So uh, I hope all of you looked at your love letters of flowers and, of course, knew them all better than I did. Uh, next Sunday, yes, we should have, uh, no, two Sundays, we will have our next February. February, of course, is known as Green Sorry, March is known as green, as the leprechaun time. Um, my direct descendants on my mother, on my grandmother's side, is Catholic Irish, and so, um, but we don't do anything for St. Patty's Day. So we'll have to see if we maybe get some trivia from the Emerald Isles. Let us begin with our call to worship. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be 
Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Our first hymn in our Lenten journey is 242, What Wondrous Love Is This? Other announcements I forgot to say. Tomorrow is family day and we will be hosting uh, pancake and sausage lunch at from 11.30 till 1.30? Till 1. Okay. If you come at 1.30, we will not feed you, but you will wash dishes. So uh, just throw that out there. Um, so from 11.30 to 1, we will be feeding people pancakes and sausages. I tried to get them to do eggs, but maybe next year. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, you call us to be more. You call us to be more than just individuals. You call us to be a family in your son's name. To work together. To sing together pray together, to minister together, and by your Spirit you would wrap us in that fellowship of purpose. As we come as a fellowship, give us this worship, give us this time of praise, to renew our faith, to strengthen our bonds with you and with each other. And allow us to be revived for another week. So as your people, we lift in one voice your son's prayer, who taught us to say, pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God forgives you. God loves you. Live the life he has for you. Looking not at the past shadows, but the forward goal of life eternally with him, now and forever. Amen. I have a children's story, but I want to save it for the children, so I apologize. Um, instead, I'm going to do something a little different, and this is going to be very simple. So I'll come down here. So every week I've been offering all the children jelly beans. And I've never really offered it to you guys. So, in Christian charity, would anyone like a jelly bean? Oh, here we go. Oh, you want one? Not a black one? Okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. Oh, what, I'm here? Okay. Any color? Oh, yeah. I like the black. Like, oh. Black is beautiful. There you go. Anyone else? Okay. There you go. Any colors? That one's good. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay. Now, I, I, I should have clarified something. Um, before you eat it, look at the color. <laughs> too, too late for that. Um, <laughs> this story is not going to go well if you have to take it out of your mouth. But uh, you, of course, all know your color. Anyone over here? Okay. Any particular color? Okay. There you go. Anyone else? Anyone? <laughs> okay, you've got Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> why is the color important? <sighs> Have you ever wondered what to pray about? Jelly bean is a reminder that there's many things we can pray about. So when you look at the jelly bean, what color? This is orange. So what should I pray about? Well, if I use the color orange, I th I'm thankful that God will eventually allow the sun to peek through and melt all the snow. And I can be like, thank you, Lord, that your seasons change and grow and I know that winter will end, and you will carry me into the fullness of spring, and then fall, and then, Lord, give me the strength to get through another winter. Just by the color of jelly bean. So next time you're like, oh, Lord, I'm not quite sure what to pray about. Think about a jelly bean. Think about something in your house, or something you see, and you go, Lord, let me talk to you about this. This item, this concern, this prayer. And so... The jelly bean is the way I was going to teach the children in a few weeks how to pray different prayers. As opposed to, oh, Lord, I don't know what to say. Well, next time, think of the jelly bean. Be like, Lord, I know I have a black jelly bean, and I really don't like it. But, Lord, let me be thankful for the wonderful sugar that I'm about to partake, which will give me more energy to steal the other ones. So there we go. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you 
the birds, the domesticated animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign for the covenant between me and the earth. Then I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Reading from 1 Peter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently for the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven, who who is at the right hand of God, with angels and authorities and powers made subject to him.
As Christians, we are a people of covenant, a people of promise, a people of contract law. Covenant is also known as testament. So we have our scripture divided into the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Covenant. In the New Testament, we are a covenant people. God made a contract and we accept it. In order to be a follower of Christ, we have to be in that contract. God has made many contracts over the millennia. The first one is the contract with Noah. One of the most universal events in history, in different cultures around the globe, is the flood narrative from Native American tradition to the Middle East tradition, to African tradition, to the Far East traditions. The flood narrative is found in many, if not all, of those traditions. The promise that God said, I will no longer seek to wipe out that which is profane, which is against me. And I will mark that promise in the sky. The first covenant. We're reminded of that even sometimes amidst the rain, a rainbow will stretch across the heavens. But it's the second covenant that I want to drill in on a little bit today. The covenant with Abraham by which the Old Testament is marked and the New Testament is forged. The covenant of a people. God saying to Abraham, I will be your God and you will be my people. In Scripture, the covenant with Abraham looks like this. So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other, the birds, however, he did not cut in half. And as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoky fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. So what does this mean? In the Middle East, when a covenant, a legal binding agreement was made between two parties, a representation of what will befall the party that breaks the covenant is made. In somewhat of a gruesome factor, the animals are brought, cut in twain, and laid out with a narrow path between them. Each of the parties then walked through the grisly reminder of their fate if they broke the covenant so that when that covenant, that promise, that testament is broken, both parties know the failure is going to lead to death. Now, we don't do that. We sign nice legal documents we stamp them, we sign them with a nice pen, and most of us don't really think about breaking promises or laws. But in the Old Testament, in the Middle East, they made it clear that if you broke it, you were not just going to get a little slap on the wrist. No, you will be cut in twain. But do you notice... As this covenant is made with Abram, 
Abraham and God what did not occur? Both parties should have walked through. But what happened to Abraham? He fell asleep. God put him into his sleep and gave him a vision of the presence of God moving through. The same presence of God that moved before the Israelites in their journey from Egypt to the Holy Land, a fire. The presence of God alone moved through. God holds the covenant with Abraham on his own effort. If not, I fail to see how the people of Israel would survive. God knew and worked into his covenant that all parties were not equal. God took on the burden. And that's why in the Old Testament you see again and again God forgave the people of Israel. And again and again he brings them back into that covenant. When they fail, God shows mercy. When they stumble, God shows grace. When they turn their back on him, he brings a prophet to remind them. The Old Testament covenant is one where God takes on responsibility. And then he said to son, to walk through, to walk through Abraham's covenant. The covenant that if you don't keep it, you will die. God sent his son so that we would live in the new covenant. A new reality of grace. In the Presbyterian church, when we join the church, we should read a little book with a green cover. This is our understanding of the covenant of grace with, through Jesus Christ. And it be, opens with this. God has come to us. The Lord spoke to the people of Israel and entered into covenant with them. From Israel came Jesus Christ. God has come to us. The Son of God bringing salvation through a new covenant entered by faith. The Lord continues to come to us by the Holy Spirit, God present in the world, and guide to the church, the new Israel. Your covenant and my covenant is forged in the cross, where the Son of God took on our sins and said, you have a new relationship with God marked by love. A covenant with great cost, paid not by ourselves, but by Jesus. And that this covenant will be renewed in the Spirit of God living in you, bringing you closer through the cross to the Father. We are a covenant people. But if God made his covenant with us, established through his son, what is our covenant? What is your promise to be a Christian to God? And what has God promised to you in his part of the covenant? Do you know? What has God promised to you? Let's start on that side of things. It's the same promise he made to Abraham, but expanded. You will be his people. God claims your life. God claims you. You're his. Now there's no mark on you in which you can see. Though in different traditions, uh, they do a mark. In the Coptic church 
in Egypt where to be a Christian is to be an outcast, they actually tattoo a cross on the wrist of young believers so that they can never forget and always be seen to be a child of Christ. So God says, you will be mine, and I will be your God. You will always be with me. And through Jesus Christ, we know that means into eternity, into the kingdom of God. You are never lost from God's love. You are never cut off from his purpose for you. He has big plans. And those plans will even overcome death. They will even overcome age. Even overcome grief and heartache and loss and brokenness and sin. God said, you are mine and never again will you be without my presence. So he poured into all your life the Holy Spirit. And the more you ask of the Spirit, the more the Spirit will give you his mission and his purpose. So that's what God says. This is the promise God lays out. You will be with me forever, always my people, never apart. What do you promise? In weddings, both couples are supposed to say the same thing. When I was a young minister, I made the mistake of whipping out the old, um, not old, more traditional vows. And as a young minister, I assumed, probably because I watched just a few too many romantic comedies, that no one would have the trouble with the obey part. So I started with the guy. I said, here are the vows, the traditional. Do you have any issues? I probably should have started with, have you read them? But that is a learning experience for later on. Because this particular gentleman's like, I have no trouble with this. I could see his beloved wife start to have a twitch in her eye. Like a spider had crawled in there. She's like, and I'm like, do you have problems with these? She's like, I want the word obey out. And I'm like, but but he he said he would do it. And she's like, good for him. <laughs> so I learned as a young minister, don't do the traditional vows. We don't always understand them. So what is your part of the tradition, of the covenant, of the testament, of the promise with God? Because it is way bigger than those traditional vows. And it's summed up like this. I will be your people. I will be your child. And I will give you everything that is in me. I will withhold nothing. And that's a hard ask. Because there's always things we want to pull back from God. Things, areas of our life where we're like, okay, God, this is my little sphere, my safe space. You can't have it. And God says, no. Trust me with you. Trust me with all of you because I want all of you. I love all of you. Your part of the covenant is to trust God completely. Just to lay there in peace, in prayer, in worship, and say, God, here I am. Take me, use me, guide me, and love into me. Are you ready?
in our covenants, in those times when we pull back and we don't commit, God says, I've sent my son to guide you. I've sent my son to heal you, to redeem you. So even in those times when, we're, when we pull back from God, he is reaching over to build that bridge again. Because as a covenant people, we acknowledge that when we fail to live up to the covenant, Jesus Christ does. And we are redeemed. So be a covenant people with the full passion of the knowledge Christ has forged that covenant, that testament. And he wants you to trust in him. Receive the full measure of that relationship as we journey to the cross, to the empty tomb. Live that your covenant is foundationed on Jesus Christ. That the big ask has already been paid. You don't have to walk through the severed bodies of animals. You don't have to worry that your sin will keep you from God. That you're not worthy of being in that covenant. Because God has done. God has paid. God has redeemed you. What God asks for you is to continually live in that covenant. This day, every day, through death into the kingdom of God, through life to be his children, now and forever. Amen. Our next hymn is 235, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed.
To God we give all. And so we present to him our offering of thanksgiving, our offering which now will be received. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavens. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Accept, O Lord, our offering, the fruit of our labors, the bounty of our life. We give it to you for your ministry, for your work, to support the light this community brings to the town of Mitchell and the gospel that's alive in all of our hearts. Amen. another part of the covenant with, with God that didn't quite fit my sermon, so I'm going to say it now. God's relationship with you should not be complicated. God desires for you to live with him, to talk with him, and to walk with him. That's all. That relationship will guide your whole life I know in, in my particular case, when I accepted that I would follow God, and I said, okay, God, this is just what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust you. And God did. God did all the hard lifting. I just have to have the courage every day to walk with him. Going back to a, uh, a wedding tradition. There was one wedding. Um, it was in the midst of, I think, um, again, romantic comedies that make things really complicated. There was this whole series in the early 2000s where everyone would write their own vows. They even made a book. And there was this one woman, she was so loquacious. She was a great writer. And she came giddy to the last um, meeting with me and the, and the couple right before they were going to get married, and she had a novel written of her vows. She had, I think, seven pages. And I was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And, of course, I always turn to the guy, and I'm like, okay, what do you have written? He opens his book. Uh, I love you. <laughs> and she looks at him, and she's like, is that all you could say? And I'm like, that's pretty good. Don't get complicated. God just wants you to have a relationship, not just. God wants to have a relationship with you. Trust in him. and He will guide you. God does the hard work in your relationship. All you do is every day walk with him. And the closer you walk with him, the more he will do what other people will say is miracles. And you'll just be like, God did it all. Don't get complicated. Just love God. For he loves you and all your things. Let us pray. Gracious God, remind us how you love us. That you love us in our brokenness. You love us in our craziness. You love us in our anger, in our confusion, in our struggles. You love us in the quiet or there's not a thought in our head. 
You love us in our soul's reflection. You love us in our laughter. As we tell a story for the thousandth time and we still think it's funny. You love us in the busyness. You love us into tomorrow. Well, we're not sure what the day will bring. You love us into worship as we sing the same old hymns. You love us into grace, into mercy, into joy. You love us into yourself. And you withhold not a moment of your presence. So, Lord, love us into the knowledge that we love you. And that we will walk with you this day and all our days. And trust you to be our rock and our foundation. That when everything falls apart, our house is built on you. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is 321, Praise the Lord the Almighty. There is some hearts at the back for young people and youth of our congregation in our Lenten journey. We are praying. Take a name. Um, even if you don't know the young person, pray for that name, for God does know them. And 
ask God to be a blessing to them as well as you. So as you leave, there is names at the back door because I know half of you usually leave that way. So I figured I'd cover the basis of uh, take a name or two and pray. Um, as you depart, um, receive the blessing of the covenant of God made with you. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you to give you his peace. Amen. Amen.